All right, let's talk about gonadotropins now. So gonadotropins are essentially exogenous sources of FSH and LH. So if we are having difficulty getting you to ovulate by boosting your endogenous FSH drive, then we will just give you straight exogenous FSH to overcome whatever barriers we're encountering. If we need to super ovulate you and your problem is not ovulation induction and we need to be aggressive or we want to be aggressive or specifically we're doing IVF, then we want to use gonadotropins in a controlled fashion. So examples of gonadotropins include high human menopausal gonadotropin, which is highly purified human men menopausal gonadotropins or HMG. The other source is recombinant FSH. Um, basically working off the alpha and beta subunits of the, of the FSH molecule and taking human cells and transfecting them with Chinese hamster ovary cells to then uh, essentially generate this uh, molecule synthetically. So those are the two common formulations that are available. As a side note, people can also use really low doses of HCG because really low doses of HCG will look like and act on the FSH receptors and the LH receptors. So some folks will use micro doses of HCG hormone. So the indication here for gonadotropins is usually people who are clomid or letrozole resistant, people who have unexplained infertility that maybe IVF is not an option for, or who would like to try something a little more aggressive before they move on to IVF. But more commonly, gonadotropins are the staple treatment of choice for superovulation or so-called controlled ovarian hyperstimulation. Controlled ovarian hyperstimulation or COH. And again, in this scenario, essentially what you're doing is you're giving these two drugs, one or both, and you're giving them exogenously and essentially they're acting directly on the ovary. The side effects with gonadotropins are actually pretty well tolerated. I mean, the biggest one is obviously it's a sub-Q injection. So these are sub-Q injections. Um, depending on, they are like one, one recombinant formulation is in a pen with a, a cartridge. Another one is a similar cartridge-based system. And then another drug is a powder that you mix with the solution and you draw it up in a little insulin needle and then you inject. So these are sub-Q injection bruising is the most common side effect. And that's injections usually that are done on the abdomen, lower abdomen. Obviously the big risk here that we alluded to earlier was the risk of multiples. The twin rate with this drug in patients with unexplained infertility, for example, is as high as 25%. It could be even higher depending on the age of the patient and the indication. And then of course the baseline triplet rate is about 5% and again could be higher um, depending on the age of the patient and the indication. For example, I had a patient who was 34 years old who was using donor sperm because her husband had medical problems that rendered him sterile. She did, she had been trying with Clomid for four or five cycles, didn't work. We did injectable cycles. She made seven follicles. We went ahead. She only made one baby out of those seven follicles. So just because you make seven follicles doesn't mean you're going to have seven babies. But you need to be very responsible and thoughtful, more specifically, about how you stimulate these patients and what, what the risk is going in and what the risk is at the time and what their tolerance is for proceeding and what your tolerance is. So there's an art to stimulating a patient with gonadotropins that is not doing IVF. And as IVF has gotten better over the last 15, 20 years, and more specifically over the last 10, the use of gonadotropins in the setting of timed intercourse or artificial insemination is slowly uh, eroding as more and more people just move straight to IVF and don't even use these drugs in these settings. So as IVF has gotten better, more and more people are moving straight to IVF and maybe using these oral medications first. And if they don't work, then they move to IVF. So some example protocols, um, just to kind of talk about how these drugs work and how we basically give them. 
So let's take Clomid and or Letrozole plus or minus metformin. So for example, let's just take a patient who's on clomiphene and she has PCOS and she's 26 years old and has never been pregnant, has irregular periods and is ready to just try something. So she's young, so we'll just try Clomid alone. Um, just for the sake of this exercise, I recognize we had talked about letrozole being superior in, the, in this patient, we would select letrozole. But again, just for the sake of this exercise, Clomid's listed first, so that's what we're gonna go with because letrozole would be identical. Um, you're gonna basically have the patient call with cycle day one, and then she gets the prescription. She starts her Clomid on cycle day three. She takes, I usually start with 100 milligrams or five milligrams of clom of let five milligrams of letrozole or 100 milligrams of clomid she takes it every day cycle days three through seven so then starting on cycle day 10 she starts using an ovulation prediction kit and when the kit turns positive she has intercourse that day and the day after so you have intercourse here intercourse here the day after cycle day 11 and 12 and obviously this is variable i mean she might have positive ovulation prediction kit on cycle day 13 and 14 or 14. Two weeks after the ovulation prediction kit is positive, she will check a pregnancy test and it's either gonna be positive or she's gonna start a period, in which case we would start the Clomid again at the same dose or a higher dose depending on her response. The other thing I like to do in these patients is one week after an ovulation prediction kit, I like to check a progesterone level. The reason I check a progesterone level is she doesn't ovulate. She has PCOS. She has an ovulation dysfunction. I want to make sure that drug is actually working. So I like to check one week after the ovulation prediction kit a mid luteal progesterone level. Okay. In the patient who's taking injectable medications, that's a little bit more involved. Essentially what they do is they'll take daily injections at a predetermined dose every day, and then they'll come in for monitoring, usually after the fourth day. So again, cycle day four. So they'll start, they'll come in on cycle day one while they're on their period, they'll get an ultrasound, they'll get a estrogen level to make sure that their ovaries are quiet, there are no cysts, no follicles, um, and the estrogen level is at baseline. And then they start daily injections and then they'll come back four days later and they'll get the estradiol level drawn and you will expect the estradiol level to start to rise as the patient gets more recombinant as, as the patient gets more exogenous gonadotropins their estradiol level should rise and their ovarian follicles should start to grow so after four days they'll come back maybe on the seventh day for they'll continue their drug and then they'll come back on the seventh day three days later for blood work and an ultrasound. And then they'll keep coming back periodically and you're titrating the dose after each monitoring visit. And when their follicles are about 18 to 22 millimeters in size, then you'll give them a trigger shot. So HCG looks like LH, right? So these patients may be at risk for ovulating, but you're kind of controlling them and watching them along the way but you're not preventing any endogenous surge in LH. So keep that in mind. They could still mount an endogenous LH surge and ovulate. So you have to watch them closely. And then when their follicles are 18 to 22 millimeters in size, then you will give them HCG, again, which looks like LH, which results in the resumption of meiosis in the follicles. So that is key. The LH surge, remember we talked about this, causes resumption of meiosis. This is critical because if this doesn't happen, then the egg that's released cannot be fertilized. So you need a mature egg in order for fertilization to occur. And if you do not have the resumption of meiosis, you will not have a mature egg. And if you don't have a mature egg, fertilization will not occur. So the trigger shot provides the stimulus necessary to cause the resumption of meiosis and all the other events that are necessary for ovulation to ultimately occur mechanically and the release of the egg. And then you would have intercourse and or an IUI or artificial insemination, which is where you place the sperm directly into the uterine cavity. If you're doing an IUI, the IUI would be done 36 hours after the trigger shot. 
And that makes sense because the patient will probably ovulate within 36 out 36 to 40 hours of the trigger shot. So you perform the IUI in that window and the sperm will should be sitting in the genital tract waiting for the eggs as they're released. Many times these patients will get supplemental progesterone to help support uh, implantation. And then again, two weeks after the HCG shot, two weeks, you check a urine pregnancy test at home, the patient's either pregnant or she starts a period and then we start over again or move on to IVF at that point, depending on what's the patient's situation. Remember, reproduction is highly individualized and very complicated. So treatment decisions sometimes are made on a month to month basis in certain circumstances. Generally, you start with clomiphene and or letrozole. You do that for three cycles. And if that doesn't work, then you move on to something like IVF. And again, patients' physical, financial, emotional uh, factors will dictate kind of their comfort for moving forward in an aggressive manner or in a more uh, graded manner.